First, you know, I was asked to sort of talk about my experience in Hampshire and kind of go through w my journey has been up until this point, and so I want to do that before I really start talking about city growers. And it's really been a, um, I've never thought about, you know, what I've done since leaving Hampshire and how it, it, it all connects. So it's really an exercise for me in trying to make sense of what I've been doing all these years. And um, a, a theme came out that really kind of started um, at Hampshire. The, the theme is sort of like, is it really almost a, well, it is like I want it to be a subtitle of um, the talk tonight, which is Leaps of Faith. Um, when I first applied to Hampshire, um, I was very excited. I visited campus. I had a, a, a friend of mine's brother was going here. I, I'm from Boston. And I spent the weekend, and I said, this, this is definitely the place for me. Um, and I applied, and I got back in the mail a rejection from Hampshire. And I was devastated. Um, and I talked to a friend's mom, and I said, I really, you know, I really want to go to this school. I think it's just the perfect fit for me. And she said, well, you should just give them a call and tell them that, you know, and ask them why. Ask them why they didn't uh, accept you. And so I got up my nerve, and I did that. And I had a scenario of, you know, I can take, live at UMass and enroll at UMass, but how many of my courses can I take at Hampshire? And, and admissions said, why don't you just come up and we'll talk. So I came up for um, the first of any, I, I came up for my first interview. Um, and by Friday of that week, they had sent me a, uh, a yes. Um, and part of what happened in that conversation at Hampshire, um, at admissions was they, they were very candid. Hampshire was, and I think, you know, this is sort of why I like Hampshire is they said, well, you don't seem to be the right fit for Hampshire. You know, you, you, you grew up in Boston, you went to parochial schools, um, you need a whole lot of financial aid, and we don't have that much financial aid. Um, this is way back when 15% of Hampshire students uh, received any financial aid at the school, and basically we're not sure you're worth the risk. We found that, you know, other students who come here who um, need this much financial aid and have your background don't do quite well. And so they took that leap of faith with me. And, you know, I was so grateful because I stepped on campus and I knew it was the right place. And, you know, I graduated in, in four years and I still, I come back to Hampshire whenever I can. This is my fourth um, talk at Hampshire. Um, I was part of Div 4, so I'm really um, grateful to be here um, and to have Hampshire be, have been a part of my um, experience, learning experience. Um, another leap of faith that Hampshire took was um, that I started um, studying gamelan when I was here at Hampshire at Amherst College. They have a gorgeous gamelan there. This is Indonesian um, music. Um, and I really, really wanted to go to Indonesia and study gamelan there. And this was my third year at Hampshire. Uh, well, I was planning this my second year to go in my third year, um, and I didn't know how I was going to do it. You know, there weren't a whole lot of programs back then at Hampshire where they could say, oh yeah, the Indonesian program, we'll send you on that, and you know, Amherst College didn't really have one. Um, so I talked with, I don't even remember who, what department it was, um, and they said, we'll pay for your plane ticket. And they, they took my tuition money and gave me $2,000 for a plane ticket to Indonesia. And I spent um, seven months there, and I learned gamelan, but I also learned so many other things. And it took me sort of on a whole new trajectory in which I was, you know, went on to U UMass and got a degree in medical anthropology, um, just based on my experiences um, um, ar around healing and all those kind of stuff while I was there. So um, the other day, I was actually, this, this was a couple of months ago, I, I got in the mail something from Hampshire, one of the brochures, and talk about programs at the school. And this one, I, I actually cut out this paragraph um, because it just, it had so much meaning for me. 
And this is way before I even knew I was coming to Hampshire even to give the Div 4 talk, never mind this one. Um, and it, this was, it was talking about teen moms that had come to the school. And I'm going to quote this. Um, one thing we rediscovered this summer as we brought new students into Hampshire Fold is that there was a pretty direct correlation between risk taking and learning. Leaps of faith are essential to the kind of learning that matters. And I, I think really this is the, th one, I want this to be the theme of this talk because wh what um, I'm going to present tonight is really, um, it's, gonna, it's, it's a leap of faith what we're doing. And I truly believe in it and I'm sort of there for the long haul. Um, but so far we've had a lot of challenges. Um, people don't believe it's p possible what we're, pro we're, we're proposing. And I'll sort of get into that in my talk so you really understand sort of the scale of what we're proposing. So um, City Grow has started two, two years ago, 2010. We're Boston's new newest urban farm. Um, our vision and mission is that we're transforming vacant lots in three neighborhoods of Boston, Dorchester, Roxbury, and Mattapan. Any, uh, can anyone know Boston well? Um, these are the, the three poorest neighborhoods in the city. Um, they also have um, the largest va number of vacant lots or percentage of vacant <coughs> land in the city um, as well. And they are luckily for us contiguous neighborhoods so that they match up. They're in the middle of the city of Boston. And we want to create jobs. Uh, we want to employ people in the neighborhood to grow food for the neighborhood but also so that they can make a living, which means our business model is a little bit more expansive than just growing food for the neighborhood. Um, we want to increase local access to nutrient-rich food and produce locally sourced food to address food security issues in the city of Boston. Um, some of you came to the Div 4 talk. This is a little bit, um, this, you've seen these pictures before, but it's, there's a lot more as well. Um, uh, so. Uh, this is our first planting. This is a, um, in Dorchester. It's a, ha a quarter acre off of Blue Hill Avenue, which is a, w one of the sort of big thoroughfares that go through Boston. And we're, it's a very pristine, beautiful um, place. Okay, and this is our newest site um, in Dorchester. It's infested with knotweed, Japanese knotweed, which is an invasive that we're trying to get out. We have a lot of partners and where um, these folks are actually from the Shuff Suffolk County Sheriff's Department. This is the, the city jail. And they're coming out to help us um, clear the land so that we can cultivate on it. Um, just to um, sort of talk about how I got to city growers. Um, after I left UMass, I worked, um, I had a, have a PhD from UMass. Um, I worked in HIV prevention for a dozen years. Um, I worked in Worcester for my dissertation. I spent two years in Worcester pretty much on the streets looking into how to make HIV prevention more effective in that population of IV drug users. Um, on the streets and in crack houses, just observing and um, doing a lot of interviewing of people uh, in and, you know, both when they were in drug treatment because they're a little bit more coherent and, you know, have a little bit more focus, but also, you know, spending time watching and um, trying to make sense of that world. Um, I was a, then became a fellow at Harvard Medical School where I met Paul Farmer. I don't know if you're familiar with Paul Farmer and Partners in Health. Um, he mostly works in Haiti now. I start, helped him start up Partners in Health um, and the Institute for Health and Social Justice. And there's actually a, um, um, we, we edited a book together called Women, Poverty, and AIDS, which is actually in the Hampshire Library, <laughs> I've been told. Um, and then I, there was a shift for me because I was realized that if I stayed with PIH, I was moving into more of global health issues, international health, which I actually thought I was going to do for a long time. Um, but having worked with IV drug users and worked sort of on the ground level, I just didn't, I really wanted to stay at the community level. 
and um, I sort of listened to my uh, intuition and sort of moved away from Partners in Health and started a couple of programs which have been mentioned. You know, I have a consulting business in which it's very public health oriented, so I'm spending a lot of time dealing with health issues like obesity and um, uh, diabetes in public housing. That was one four-year project that we were consulting on. Um, I was also, um, and still am, the wellness director for a Boston Public School. It's a K through eight school in Mattapan. And we received all these grants, you know, from Blue Cross Blue Shield and um, the Boston Public Health Department to basically Im increase awareness of healthy eating among students. Eat your five fruits and vegetables a day and get plenty of exercise. And early on in, the, in this process, we um, realized, there was a committee of us, including the principal of the school, realized that um, we really needed to take, uh, in order to teach students um, how to live their lives differently, we needed to change the environment, sort of called taking an environmental approach to change. We needed to change the environment and basically model for those students how to um, change their health habits. And at that point in time, Boston Public Schools, we, we weren't a good model. You know, we, the food was horrible. It's, you know, federally, federally um, federal school lunch program, that's what we got. We were a satellite kit, um, kitchen, so everything came from Philadelphia, frozen, and was popped into warming trays. Um, and so we decided that what we needed to do to really change the culture in the school and, and among students was to secede from the federal school lunch program. And we did that successfully for two years. Um, we took the money that they would normally have spent on Sodexo, which is the big, I think it's actually at Hampshire as well, it's, it's your dining hall food service provider. Um, and we went to a small provider, City Fresh Foods, minority owned local business um, and we said feed our kids and they br they cooked up this is what they do they brought in fresh food and kids were eating they were eating phenomenal I mean we didn't have a, a, a hunger problem in the school anymore um, it was fresh it was plenty of vegetables you know they actually were serving brown rice and and whole wheat and kids were eating it um, you know, the results were that, and I can't, can't say there's a direct correlation because, you know, one doesn't really know, um, but the MCAS, fifth grade MCAS science scores were the, um, that, that two years following were the highest in the city of Boston for this school, which is 85% um, free and reduced lunch school. So it's, it's, these kids are, that means their family income of, if, of a family of four is less than $34,000 a year which in the city of Boston is not very much money to live on. Um, <coughs> so <coughs> what we realized, though, is that um, there needed to be a sustainable piece to this. And in, after two years, the school was moved to a larger school with a full cafeteria. And in that caf, we weren't able to keep City Fresh Foods as a result of that because we, there was staff there. there. It was already a cafeteria. We, and what happened was, that within a two-year period, we spiraled backwards um, so that there really uh, wasn't um, the, 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 the um, progress that we had made around food was completely negated, um, which really leads to um, where I think I am right right now in that there needed, I feel like there needed to be a deeper approach, um, and a deeper environmental approach to this problem. The problem is obesity, the problem is, you know, Boston has the highest rate of obesity among preschool age children um, in the nation. Um, which I have checked that statistic so many times because people say to me, that couldn't be true. And MMWR, <laughs> mortality is a CDC, that's, that's where it comes from. Um, so really, I, I realized that, um, and a, a number of other people in Boston realized we need to change the food system. 
um, that you can't just take one school and say, okay, we did it, you know, um, because it does, it just doesn't last. Um, so this is, City Growers is an attempt to change that food system, and we hope that, um, you know, in the next few years we'll be, we'll be sourcing fresh produce in the Boston Public Schools um, and kids will be eating better as a result of it. And it's really an attempt to localize um, the whole food system uh, and then expand from there. And that sort of brings me back to, like, I feel like my best work and it's, it's an important thing to ask yourself, I think, where is your best work? Like, where, what's your skill set? My best work really is it, at the local level. Um, even though so much of this work involves policy research and changing policy and all of that as well. This is our farm. You saw the first slide where we had just done a new planting at the Blue Hill Farm. This is after about a, a month's worth of growing. And we do a lot of lettuce. Um, because right now our main um, customers are restaurants and retail. That's the high-end market for the city of Boston. There's a lot of restaurants that really want fresh produce that they can say it was grown in Roxbury. Um, and so that's where we need to start out um, because we're a for-profit, which I will get into in a minute. Um, we're, we're not growing. We're growing for sustainability and to provide decent jobs for people. So our model of production, so f we started in 2010. We established a viable small-scale urban farm that supported one or two individuals at a living wage as uh, a proof of concept for our model. And, you know, we had talked a lot about earlier about, you know, the need for a business plan. This is what, you know, we need to prove that we can do this on a small scale before we can get the kind of funding and equity um, that we need and, and other business partners that we need to um, move forward, you know, move ahead and expand our, our production. So this year we're build, starting to build out our infrastructure, increase acreage. We're, we're actually training new farmers now and we're um, partnering with a new entry which is in Lowell, Mass, that does that really well. And then we'll seek out other land opportunities and repeat the process. Um, we really see ourselves as a cooperative. That's our model, and I can talk more about that later if people are interested in knowing. We've played around with a lot of different models, but this one seems to be the one that works for us, where the city growers will always be the brand, and, and farmers um, will grow for the brand, but with it, within there, there will be a lot of flexibility on um, what market, what they grow, and, um, and what market they grow for. Um, so, where is all this land in Boston? Um, <laughs> believe it or not, uh, and we, this is the research we had to do in order to, you know, s figure out whether the, this model was possible. There are 800 vacant acres of land in the city of Boston. 800 acres. How many, how many acres is at Hampshire? 15 that are being farmed on? It's 800 acres of land in the city of Boston. That just floored us. Um, and the, you know, we went and met with the mayor and we said we want to have this farm and we want 16 acres. And he said, that land could be housing. You know, that's where I'm going to make my tax. You know, that's where I'm going to make the money for the city. And we said to him, all we need, all we need is 3%. 3% and we have 16 acres of land. And you know, there's been, um, we've done the numbers of how many jobs that we create. and Actually, we have a report, if people are interested in, that was just done by Conservation Law Foundation um, that really outlines um, exactly that, you know, what, what, is the, what are the possibilities for urban agriculture in the city of Boston. So our goal for Boston is, you know, it's the largest city in Massachusetts with actually the fastest growing, another statistic that's hard to believe, but fastest growing food stamp program in the country. We want it to be the hot spot of nutritionally dense food production um, and sort of be a model that other cities can, can use. Once we have, and this is the business plan piece, once we have 10 acres um, into production, our farm will be self-sustainable. That, that's the scaling up approach that if we just farmed on only one acre, would never be sustainable. And I can talk more about that, um, you know, in the question part. Um, 
so there are other urban farms in the city of Boston. There's, I'm sure you've heard of the Food Project. Has anyone heard of the Food Project? Um, they've been around for about 20 years. Um, they have a very different model than we do. They're really about using um, farming as a tool to um, sort of get to help um, teens um, work cooperatively and develop cooperative um, projects. Um, we really are um, um, focused on production. Um, that's our main goal. It's not really about education. It's not about um, uh, you know having school groups come out and learn how to grow broccoli. Um, uh, you know, as I said, restaurants and retail are now our, uh, our main business, but we also can get um, produce into bodegas, you know, which are the small um, neighborhood, um, not supermarkets, but markets, because there are no supermarkets in many parts of Boston, um, so that, that we can get fresh and fruits and vegetables into those um, markets w where other distributors won't, won't touch there. These are two of our farmers, Nataka and Bobby. They've been growing independently in Boston for a long time, and we, we found them and hooked up with them, and now they're growing on a couple of um, quarter acres um, that they have from city gardens, and they're also growing for city growers. Um, so, you know, why urban farming now? And I, I think this is probably a well enough educated audience that I don't have to go into this very much, you know? It's, it's, we're ready, you know? Um, there's a the demand, there's the innovations, we, there's global warming that's driving us, you know, there's um, the, the interest in be ha things be carbon neutral, all of that's possible when you're not um, growing in the middle, in the Midwest and shipping all over, you know, the country from there. So we are hyperlocal. Um, that's sort of a new term that's come around in the last couple of years. Um, and these are just some statistics as to where our food, how far our food travels before it gets to us, and how concentrated um, the farms are. Uh, and I, I referenced here um, the sources of this. The True Cost of Food is a great video put out by the Sierra Club. Um, you know, there's a great need for fresh fruits and vegetables in, in Boston and also inexpensive, you know, affordable because so many people in Boston are on food stamps and needing food assistance. Recently, we've realized that <sighs> urban ag is being used to, to refer to pretty much anything that has to do with growing in the dirt in Boston. It's sort of become viral. And I think it's really important to, um, to distinguish between um, a community gardens and what we're doing. Um, another statistic is that's um, re um, relevant to Boston is they have the largest number of community gardens per capita in the country. Um, so there's a lot there's a lot of people who are gardening for themselves and sometimes even, you know, to sell the food to make a little bit of extra income in Boston. Um, and still, you know, the whole city is fresh food insecure. So even when you have a lot of gardening going on, it still doesn't sort of solve the problem. Um, also, urban farms, unlike community gardens, they can, you know, we're, we're focused on producing volume. We're intensively growing, and we're, you know, um, community gardeners just don't necessarily have that same goal. Um, we're also focused on um, nutritional density. We're hoping to get some federal grants to look into that and do some research projects. Um, we know that if the soil is rich in certain things and you put those seeds in the ground, you're going to have a more nutritionally dense um, product. Also, certain seeds actually can be, certain varietals of broccoli are more nutritionally dense than others. But we haven't really figured that out yet. We're, we're really in a beginning stage, and that would be a really interesting internship project for Hampshire students, among others. But um, also, at Urban Ag, you know, the whole point is that there's, you're interactive with the urban ecosystem. Um, you know, there's tons of compost produced in the city. You know, we can turn, um, or tons of uh, waste produced, and we can turn that into compost. 
Um, you know, we can, we're figuring out ways to use gray water um, for irrigation. And who has been amazing at this is, and you should all check out this website, Growing Power in Milwaukee, Will Allen, he won a MacArthur Award for this kind of um, urban ag technology. Um, totally on the cutting edge. Um, also our goal is to be ca carbon neutral. You know, the first year we actually had Met Boston Metro Pedal Power um, delivering our veggies. Um, it turned out to not be economically viable when you're growing on a quarter acre, so we, we had to stop doing that, but maybe by year three we'll, we'll um, be able to do that again. We also had a grower last year who, um, this is a bicycle tiller, um, which we hope that he can build one of those for us um, once we're able to raise some more money. Uh, and this is our, this is what we, this is a poster that we put up in restaurants and retail to let people know that, you know, this is sort of our marketing slogan here. Um, so just to get back to, you know, it's, we have grappled with um, for-profit, not-for-profit, some, some mix for, the, for a long time. And we keep coming back to, if you're a farm, you need to be sustainable. In order to be sustainable, you can't be driven by grant dollars. Um, and we have come to really believe that this is um, how we're going to maintain ourselves. Um, there are a lot of urban farms that are not-for-profits, and they're fighting over uh, increasingly uh, smaller pool of funding. Um, and really what we realized, you know, in the last year is that we're building a new industry. And if you're, if we want to be part of what is building a new food system, we can't be dependent on grant funding. Um, we need to figure out a way to grow and market our produce so that we can be sustainable. Um, so we have a sort of bro a broader mission than a lot of urban farms. So we're not just growing food in poor neighborhoods. You know, we really want to establish a resilient food system um, to replace the currently what we see, and I'm sure everybody in this room sees as a broken food system. Um, and we realize that it isn't just going to be us that do that. We, you know, there gonna, there needs to be a confluence of factors. Um, eventually, local will be cheaper than getting your romaine lettuce from California um, because of the price of oil. Um, eventually, hopefully, if we all call our members of Congress and, and um, push this, the farm bill will c become more, more like the food bill um, as opposed to growing, you know, sub subsidizing commodities. It actually will um, help to subsidize and um, promote research into um, fruits and vegetables, which are now considered in the food bill, I mean the farm bill, a specialty crop. I mean, they're just, they're not even in there as, you know, what's being, what's being subsidized. This is what we're growing into. You know, we started out as city growers. Um, we had, you know, we're crop production, local job creation, farm research and development. Up until um, very recently, we were we had. If you look over at the Urban Farming Institute of Boston, we were doing land remediation, which means you can't grow on the soil that is is th that comes with the vacant lot. You have to grow on top of that soil. We were, so you have to spend a lot of money to bring in clean soil in order to 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 grow food for the community. Um, we were also doing training. You, we want to hire locally, but there's no farmers. There are very few farmers in the city of Austin. Um, so we have to train people who, who want to develop that entrepreneurial skill. Um, we were doing all the policy research. Boston is now being rezoned for commercial ag um, because we said, well, we want to grow in this lot. And they said, well, that's not zoned for commercial ag. Um, and we were, we were starting to just do a lot of education in the community because the community wanted to know so what was happening. Um, and we realized we couldn't have all of those 
jobs and still be th thinking, you know, strategically about making a profit. So just recently, we formed the Urban Farming Institute of Boston, which um, is like a whole other business that we have. Um, and we have a board, and we're really trying to launch that so that, number one, it can, it can um, fund um, the things that are very difficult for a for-profit to get funded. Okay, so the first um, four years, um, City Growers is really needs to depend on some foundation and um, slow money capital um, in order to, you can't just get a piece of land and grow on it. You need to remediate that land, and that's where the expense is, and that's what a farmer can't really ex afford to, to um, grow or to, to take on. Um, partnerships have really become important to, to us as well. We had the Sheriff's Department coming out with their um, workers. Um, New Entry does a lot of, is going to start doing a, a lot of our training. Um, Conservation Law Foundation, Boston Workers Alliance, every s neighborhood association is on board with us. They're our partners. Um, they're the ones that have been watching out on this vacant land, you know, for 40 years, and most of it's been vacant for that long. Um, and we want them to be a part of the process. In fact, you know, city growers actually will never own a piece of land in the city of Boston. Um, it will either remain in the community or depend if the community wants to um, make it um, sort of conservation land, we will, the Urban Farming Institute will help them do that. Um, we really tru belie truly believe that it's the community that's going to be driving this process. Um, and that they sh that that um, they have more power to appropriate the land in their community than city growers does, and they have more power in that sense of the city and the mayor has to listen to the community because this is the land in their neighborhood, and we don't really want to as a business appropriate that power. We really want it to stay within the neighborhood. And that's a little bit risky. Um, it means we really need to work closely in the neighborhood. Um, and we, City Growers, needs to look like the neighborhood. And it needs to represent the interests of the neighborhood. And, you know, those are all challenges, um, but, but, you know, necessary challenges that we need to um, face. So yeah, I already talked about this. Um, you know, there's there's some great videos out and uh, YouTube videos that I really recommend that really illustrate this this I these issues in a much more in-depth way than this one slide. You know, the true cost of food is one. The Sierra Club. There's a um, YouTube video called "Food Lobby Goes to School." It's amazing six minutes and y you just get um, the lobbyists and, co and Congress and you know the food federal school lunch program and what what that what's happening at that level um, uh, there's a TEDx by um, this guy Ken Cook on the farm bill that's another I think it's a 15 minutes and it's amazing like um, so I haven't actually used the term. Oh no, I've used it only a couple of times. Sustainability, but that's really sort of what we're we're about. Um, you know, we believe that eventually um, we won't be we'll only be a, able to get f fresh fruits and vegetables um, from our you know within a hundred miles, um, just because um, it won't be affordable otherwise. Like I said, we formed the institute because we still need a lot of help. I mean, grants, even, even for city growers, grants um, are going to help us move forward. We need, there actually are some federal and state grants that we both have gotten and will apply for so that we can kind of do the um, research that documents that urban farming can be economically viable. And we need to, the more we prove that, the more support we're going to get in terms of equity, um, you know, loans and, and buy-ins from individuals, and also um, grant money on the institute side. Um, so, you know, there's this global shift, I think, that's happening. And these are sort of, I didn't even, the more I thought about this, it's just so um, 
on the, we're so on the tip of the iceberg, um, but I think that, you know, what is happening, it's sort of big food and health issues have, have become almost viral in a very short period of time, and this gets back to sort of this leap of faith. Uh, you know, we need to ask ourselves these questions, you know, what is happening to our globe, you know, to our, to our world, and how can we impact it? And um, there was, unfortunately, she passed um, this past year, a biologist at UMass, Lynn Margulis, and um, she is a, was a driving force in, in she's an evolutionary bi biologist, um, in, in pushing a completely different theory from Darwin's theory of evolution. Um, and I think it's very profound. And I, this, to me, is sort of what needs to happen on so many levels, not just about the food system. But, um, you know, life did not take over the globe by combat. And this is, you know, the, Darwin's theory, but by networking. And I think this sort of new era, there's a new age that we're entering um, that's really going to be dependent and, and flourish, you know, on cooperation and mutual inter interdependence. And if we can kind of see this on a micro or organism level, then maybe we can mirror it, you know, as human beings um, on a societal level.